A brief note to any parents that might be listening in with children today. You may want to hit pause on this episode and come back to it later. There are discussions about Santa Claus and what follows here, and let's just say they disclose some proprietary information that some younger minds might not be ready for. And one more announcement before we get into full swing on this Christmas thing here. I'm, I'm proud to announce that today's episode is sponsored by Peace Addict Tie Dyes. They have some of the coolest dyed clothing designs that I've ever seen, including some holiday themed ones. I just ordered myself one of their double candy cane t-shirt designs, which is super cool, super unique, and I'm looking forward to sporting this throughout the rest of the holiday season. And they also have a Christmas tree t-shirt design too. I don't know how the artist Katie goes about making these, but they're just so cool and just in time for the holidays. Two, Peace Addict is a Colorado local small business, and they also do custom orders and offer tie-dyeing classes in the Denver area. So order yourself a t-shirt, stock up on some Christmas gifts, and support local art. And what could be better than that? So check them out at peaceaddictlife.com. We all had different experiences and traditions surrounding Christmas growing up, but by far the most unanimous icon of this season is Santa Claus. Even if you didn't celebrate Christmas at all, you still encountered this man and his myth. I mean, you can hardly ignore the large man that can be found in department stores and shopping malls alike this time of year, always dressed in a poorly fitting red velvet suit, seated atop his comfy winter throne. Whether you engaged this fantasy or didn't celebrate the holiday at all, we all encountered this man and his story in some shape or form. Some of us out there bought the myth wholesale. Did you believe in Santa Claus when you were a child? <laughs> I did, yes. Lock, stock, and barrel. Oh, yeah. 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 I did. Yeah, I definitely did. For a long while. I believed in Santa Claus past the age that it was developmentally appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fun. And there are others that never believed in Santa Claus at all. No, I didn't. As a child, no, my, my, I, most of my life was growing up in a, with a single mom. And my mom's attitude was she wasn't giving Santa Claus credit for what she was busting her butt to try to do. And there are some that never even celebrated Christmas as children. No, like we didn't celebrate Christmas until I was 21. My parents, honestly, like looking back, I don't even know if they really knew why we weren't celebrating Christmas. And there's at least one of us out there that, well maybe hasn't fully given up on the belief in Santa just yet. I was still really young when, when I was kind of exposed to the, the lie that adults perpetrate that he's not real. But I mean, we all know Santa's real, so we ain't gotta, we ain't gotta play that game. Daniel Powell, and welcome to the Grounded Presence Podcast, where together we explore authentic identity, deep community, and the ever-evolving spiritual journey. But this week, this week's a little different because we are exploring the ever-evolving holiday journey. Because the way we experience the holidays changes as we age and particularly the way we experience the magic of Christmas and the Santa myth changes as we age. We all interact with this Santa myth, and this time of year in general, 
in our own different and unique ways. And around Christmas time and the holidays, most of us have such a wide range and mixed bag of emotions. And this week's episode is an homage to the complexity, the comedy, the beauty, and the heartache that is the human experience. All as it can be seen through the lens of how we interact with this Santa myth, and more broadly, the holidays and Christmas time. And what follows here are stories and feelings that I've collected from nine different individuals that I've talked to. And believe me, there are some gems in here, and I am so glad that I get to share all these with you. So let's get started here. First up is the tale of how my friend Brian Ivester learned the truth about Santa Claus. I, I don't know if I ever did like the whole sit on Santa Claus's lap. That That's a little creepy going to the fake mall Santa. But I definitely did like the milk and cookies and carrots for the reindeer and writing letters. And my daughters and I still set out a glass of milk, cookies and carrots. And my daughters are all in high school and <laughs> 17, 16, 13. So, but I, I, I remember I was, I was a young kid. I was probably five and uh, my mom came to me and basically was like, Hey, there's this family in need that, you know, they're, they're not going to have any presents this year. And I, I promise I'll make it up to you, but I, I want to give them one of your gifts. And I remember I was a little five-year-old kid and I was supposed to get like, I, I, and I know I was supposed to get, cause I saw the present, the millennium Falcon from Santa Claus. But my mom took that millennium Falcon and gave it to this family in need. But before doing it, we had this whole conversation about it. It was like, okay. And so that was kind of my, so I was still really young when my parents started trying to convince me that Santa wasn't real. Brian's probably in the statistical minority. I don't think many people out there can say that their parents actually tried to convince them that Santa isn't real. It's probably a much more common story to find out from some older kids on the playground or by overhearing your parents say something that you weren't supposed to hear. Or maybe the dream was even crushed by a chance encounter with the department store Santa who has taken a smoke break out back. But my friend Dr. Lauren Gorog is probably also in the statistical minority and that her parents encouraged the fantasy for what her and many of us might consider to be a bit longer than is typically healthy. Her mom really pulled out all the stops to convince her of Santa Claus's existence. Here's her story. <laughs> That's funny because, you know, this is one mom loves to tell people, um, she loves to tell people how she got me to believe in Santa Claus for a longer amount of time than was appropriate for my age. So it was until I was 12 because she rallied with all of the other adults to trick me and my cousin who stopped believing in Santa Claus and basically curated the whole Christmas to make us believe in it. You know, it's a big elaborate story, but it really ended up shaming me because I went back and really believed again and told my friends and the parents were just like, what's wrong with you? And we should call your mom. <laughs> and so they basically had camcorders back in the day. And so they just took video of everybody sleeping and shot the, you know, camera and the one person that was, I guess my aunt recording like stopped my mom recorded her sleeping and then vice versa. And then a little video was left underneath a tree to show me and my cousin that Santa does exist because who could have taken the video of the whole family sleeping. Now the real problem comes when Lauren shares this recording with one of her friends as proof of Santa Claus's existence. Well, when I brought the tape back to my friend to show her that Santa Claus really was real, and I was like, no, we have to put this in your recorder, and her mom was standing in the back helping us um, work the TV and VCR, and put it in, and I'm trying to explain, like, this miracle that has happened, and her mom, like, looked at me with, 
I don't, I think it was disappointment or concern and, and like broke the news to me. And I just remember leaving and feeling very, very small. And then my mom, when I went back and told her, just kind of was like laughing. And I think it might've been a fight. I'm not really sure at this point, but that was the moment I found out. They really love the fairy tale kind of idea. It's funny now, but also I don't know how healthy that was. <laughs> Now, my personal experience with Santa Claus growing up was far different from Lauren's, and it was also far different from Brian's. My parents were very upfront with me and my sister from square one. They just said, hey, there's a Santa thing. Santa's not real, but it's really fun to pretend like he is. And we had a ton of fun with it. We would leave out the cookies and milk. We even had our own special recipe for reindeer food that we would sprinkle on the lawn on Christmas Eve to make sure that we attracted Santa's reindeer to our house. And it was like this mixture of crushed up cereal and candy bits mixed into that. So in the morning, Santa's cookie would have a bite taken out of it, the milk would be gone, and then there would be a little note left that had been signed by Santa himself. And I'm sure this was my mom's idea, but what she did is she drew out Santa's signature on a card in Elmer's glue, and then she covered that with multicolored sparkles for a simply magical looking note. And it was always a ton of fun living in this fantasy of Santa Claus, even though at the end of the day, I knew the truth, but I really don't think that it at all diminished my experience of the magic of Christmas. But probably one of the biggest reasons my parents chose to handle the Santa Claus myth this way was due to the way my dad found out that the Santa Claus myth was a farce. It was pretty jarring for his little boy brain. And you heard him on the intro to this episode. He was the one saying that as a child, he believed in Santa Claus lock, stock, and barrel. Well, it was actually, you know, a little embarrassing to me. I was in the fourth or fifth grade and the uh, teacher gave us a crossword puzzle. It was a simple crossword puzzle, you know, and it had the name of a lead reindeer and all sorts of things. But one question was uh, Santa was the clue. And let's just say it was 10 across. It was a three letter word. And uh, I wasn't really sure. But uh, when the teacher told us the answer was dad, that was when I knew and she said something along the lines of, uh, and, and of course, 10 across is dad, and I'm sure y'all already knew that. Well, yeah, uh, I'm not so sure I did. And learning the hard truth about Santa also had a bit of a domino effect in other areas of my dad's life. Uh, a little sad. In fact, as I think about it, you know, every time I think about it now, it's a little, a little sad. Because that ended the magic. I can add that after that also, I mean, I begin <laughs> to wonder, okay, what other things am I going to find out about? I remember we lived in Texas and my mom's folks lived in Tennessee. And we would go, you know, it would take us a day driving to get to Arkansas or several hours, whatever. And then, you know, we would go on from there to Tennessee. And I remember thinking, so I wonder if it really takes us this long to go there or are they taking us a, a circuitous route, a roundabout way to make us think that it's longer because they didn't want us wanting to go there all the time. So who knows? I mean, it wasn't like a major thing, you know, it was a minor thing. And I, I, I discounted, I said, you know, that that wasn't the case, but it messed with my reality a little bit. And that's, uh, well, one of the reasons that we decided to be upfront with you and your sister about that. My dad's not alone out there. There are many with similar stories of feeling shaken, shocked, and embarrassed when they find out that the myth of Santa Claus isn't a reality. And you know, it's, it's really a shame that such a beautiful and magical fantasy has the potential to end in such a negative set of experiences. Here's Jeremy Herzer with a similar story. When I 
learned from older kids. I think I was, I believed in Santa until I was maybe, I don't know, seven or eight. And I heard some older kids at the mall talking about it, about Ugh, my mom still thinks I should believe in Santa or something along those lines, something where they said, like, can you believe, you know, something, something still believe in Santa. And I remember in that moment being so angry at my parents, like feeling embarrassed and ashamed, like how stupid could I be, you know? to believe Santa Claus. Cause you know, as a kid, you're always like, you want to believe you really want that to be true. It's such an intoxicating and really comforting thought. And I remember associating that directly with, with God and saying like, I wonder if, is God real? <laughs> is God the same thing? Is God made up as well? I'm not a parent, right? But if you want to tell your children, um, we do the Santa Claus game. Right. Santa Claus isn't real, but we do the game and we do the kind of pomp and circumstance. Like, I think that's amazing. I think that's wonderful. But I think to say, no, 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 trust me, believe in this thing. And then all of a sudden go, psych. I mean, I, I don't see how that can't have a negative, a detrimental effect. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think it's it's naive to say, nah, there's no way there's no negative to that. It's all positive. Um. That's just my opinion. And again, I'm not a parent. So any parent could listen to that and go, dude doesn't know what he's talking about. And that's entirely possible. But that's my opinion. As a former child, that's my opinion. Jeremy's experience finding out that Santa Claus wasn't real feels like a very common one. But what isn't common is how he now looks back at his belief in Santa as a child. He'll share more with us about how he sees his belief in retrospect. And it's one of the most introspective accounts of believing in Santa that I've ever heard. For him, Santa represented so much more than just the magic of abundant gifts and childhood whimsy. For him, Santa represented the deep relational longing that we all experience. I mean, we definitely, you know, we would get up early and Santa Claus would have brought our gifts. So, uh, and again, I, I fully believed that lock stock and barrel and as a matter of fact we would have i grew up in a really small town and so outside of a really small town so we would go to town uh and i remember one time i was a little boy i remember um we had gone to this local restaurant and it was i don't know 100 people there they had all the tables out and it was like a santa claus was there one of the you know guys in town had dressed up as santa claus and he was there to give out some gifts and he gave out a few gifts and then he's like, Oh, ho, ho, I got to go, you know, get my sleigh ready. And he, he left. And I remember like scrambling to get outside to see him fly away in his sleigh. And I remember just how crestfallen I was when I got out there and he was gone, you know? Um, and I think more than anything, this is not a Santa specific thing, but I think more than anything, what I've realized about myself as a child is that I wanted to matter to people, you know, and I wanted to matter to Santa Claus. I wanted to know that Santa Claus knew me individually as a boy and uh, valued me. So, so there were things like that that we had a couple of times where one time a, a neighbor dressed as Santa Claus and came to our house and gave us our gifts. And I, again, same drill. I remember like, frantically trying to see Santa Claus get in his sleigh and fly away and like talk to him before, you know, as he's getting into his, so I could have one-on-one -on -one time with Santa. Um, but in terms of traditions, you know, we didn't have any, we, we didn't have much. I will tell you, uh, my, <laughs> I always wanted a tube of chocolate chip cookie dough in my stocking. And, uh, I remember one Christmas morning, I ate the whole thing and I was so sick, so sick, just gnarly sick, which, you know, God bless my parents, but I'm like, what are you thinking? So <laughs> I'm just so impressed with Jeremy's insights and self-awareness of his childhood self. My guess is that it's, it's a relatively uncommon experience, you know, projecting a deep relational longing onto Santa like this. But on the other hand, around this time of year, I don't think that there is one of us that can say we don't experience at least some form of deep relational longing. My friend Jonathan Bigelow experienced this in a different way. His family didn't celebrate Christmas when he was growing up, 
And as a child, he remembers looking in on the holiday and feeling like a bit of an outsider, desiring to take part in this cultural celebration. No, um, no, like we didn't celebrate Christmas until I was 21. My parents, they had a whole bunch of different reasons for why we weren't celebrating it. And honestly, like looking back, I don't even know if they really knew why we weren't celebrating Christmas. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think like the reasons that were stated were that, you know, it was a pagan holiday and its roots weren't even um, around, you know, Christ's birthday. It was just basically like we couldn't be a part of this, this, you know, cultural celebration because there was something wrong with it. And a whole bunch of reasons given for like why we were right and everybody else was wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I think honestly, um, growing up, you know, I wanted to celebrate Christmas. I wanted to celebrate Halloween. And I think, you know, on a more fundamental level, that's probably a very human desire because it's part of like wanting to connect with, you know, your, your generation and your, your culture, you know, in a broader sense. Part of it's just like wanting to integrate and to feel like you're a part of what's going on. I think for me, you know, that's, that's what I was going for. And now my parents, you know, celebrate Christmas. And I have mixed feelings because I think I have a lot of, you know, associations with it from when I was younger. And now it's like we're doing it. And and so it's like, you know, just trying to let all of that go and just engage with it now as something that we do as a family, you know, to connect with people. Yeah, I think that's hard in some ways because it's like, you know, what was all of that, you know, about and realizing that you know all of that is gone now it doesn't exist but it's it's definitely like part of my experience you know and so just like trying to figure out how to i guess connect with the experience now you know it's just so interesting the variety of ways that we interpret and celebrate this holiday differently jonathan and his family didn't celebrate the holiday at all because of religious reasons. And then some others celebrate it in a completely non-religious manner. And then there are even other families out there that celebrate it as primarily a religious holiday <laughs> and do their best to exclude Santa completely from the equation. My friend Josh McDowell grew up in such a home. Oh, so yeah, that was, I, I don't remember a time that I ever believed in Santa Claus because mom always, you know, she was always upfront about it. Most of my life was growing up in a, with a single mom, and my mom's attitude was she wasn't giving Santa Claus credit for what she was busting her butt to try to do, and and she she didn't. I think from a religious standpoint, Santa Claus, the whole concept of Santa Claus bothered her, and so we never played Santa Claus. But she always said to me, even as a little kid, now don't ruin this for other kids because they believe in Santa Claus. Don't ruin it for your cousins. But, you know, Santa Claus is not real. And Santa Claus was like this fake thing. And I think my mom's fear was that if I believed in Santa Claus and then later in life found out Santa Claus wasn't real, maybe I would say, well, mom, you lied to me about Santa Claus. You lied to me about the Easter Bunny. Did you lie to me about Jesus? Santa Claus was was something in our family that, or in our family, it was just me and mom, but that was like Santa Claus stole Christmas from from Jesus. And so, so you know, we grew up not, I mean, that wasn't spoken a lot, but, but that was kind of the underlying message was that Santa Claus was off point. Jesus was the point. We sing, we sing happy birthday to Chris, to Jesus at uh, Christmas. Uh, at some point in my childhood, we would that would be a tradition. We would sing happy birthday to Jesus. So I guess that was a normal Christian family where we, you know, it was we tried hard to make it about Jesus and not Santa. So I don't really there's not really much about Santa in my background. No cookies, no milk. We didn't do that. Um, the um, mom and I, mom built her mom built a house that uh, well, her. 
her brother helped her build a house. And so she was a homeowner. We grew, grew up in a, you know, a nice house, but other than the house, we were, we were really, life was really, really tight. So if we had a cookie, there was no chance we were going to leave it out overnight. I mean, it was, you know, it was just, that wasn't going to happen. A cookie was a, a cookie was, was worth eating. You know what I mean? And since we didn't, we didn't believe, we didn't do the Santa Claus thing anyway, from that standpoint, there would be no, you know, there was no reason to. So it never, that never happened. The, the tradition we did have was when I woke up on Christmas morning, there were gifts unwrapped under the tree as if Santa Claus had brought them. But we, you know, we treated the gifts like that, but at the same time, never, never pretended they were actually from Santa. Both Josh and Jonathan's experiences are kind of similar because they are very religious in nature, but honestly, they, they really couldn't be on further ends of the spectrum. And these are both the more extreme and rare varieties of how people interact with the holiday. I think by and large, even though the season can drive all of us up a wall at times, most of us interact with the festivities in a pretty relaxed manner. And I've got a few more stories to share with you about the ways we interacted with Christmas and Santa as children. And these last few are just more pleasant reflections from what I think are the most normative perspectives on celebrating the holiday. And this is Joe Burnham recalling his experiences as a child. All the standard stuff, we put out the milk and cookies, we'd watch the, the news as they were doing the, the Santa radar on the, you know, with the weather. And then oh, we picked up Santa in this location and it was like, Oh, better get to bed. Cause he's getting close. And um, we'd, you know, go downstairs um, the, the rule on, what was the rule on Christmas morning? So the rule on Christmas morning was my parents had to walk into the room first where all the presents were, but the, there would be stuff out all over the place. And, you know, just tons of it was like unwrapped and just out and visible. And that was the stuff from Santa and the stuff from my parents was all wrapped and had names and stuff on it. And so there was, there was two distinct sets of gifts that way. And my parents knew that we would search for stuff. So they would actually hide stuff at the neighbor's house. And so they would have the neighbors store the stuff from Santa. And then they'd go over and pick it up after we went to bed. Joe says that over the course of his entire adult life, even since his sophomore year in high school, the entire holiday season has just been a crazy nonstop roller coaster of emotions. And I asked him to take a breath and try to reconnect with the emotions of what it felt like to be a kid absorbed in the magic of Santa Claus. And here's what he shared with me. There was just all kinds of energy surrounding Santa when I was, you know, it's funny because it's, it is the exact opposite to my, my initial response to the holidays so the exact opposite of that ugh. It's 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 enchanted and it's mystical and it's magical and it's and it's playful and it's fun and it's it's not work or striving or yeah, it is the exact opposite of 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 yeah, it's just it's just beautiful. It is really yeah. And as with all stories about belief in Santa Claus, the truth comes out and the magic fades at some point. But Joe was lucky enough to learn the truth in a rather gentle and non-traumatizing way. I'm trying to think of when I, I sort of figured out that Santa wasn't real. Probably eight, something like that. Seven, eight, just sort of put it together on my own. My parents did a really good job of making the whole Santa thing real. You know, I just, I just think I, I, I thought through the whole thing and just sort of logically evaluated. It was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's actually what's going on. <laughs> and it just sort of figured it, and then just asked my mom point blank. Actually, I asked her point blank when my brother was in the car, and she found some way of pushing off the conversation for a little bit. And then afterwards, when he wasn't around, told me, you know, my, my mom was just like, well, there was this guy, St. Nicholas, and we just, we aim to, to manifest his generosity. And that's where we get the idea of Santa Claus. So it's like how we're sort of honoring him. 
And so the goodness of that just tied to this actual person who existed at one point. And, and so the myth actually took on a different form. You know, I remember once I figured it out and then I was a little punk and told my brother, but then I, I set out on a mission to, once I got busted for telling him, um, I set out on a mission to reinstill his belief and, and make him think that actually I was wrong and I, I, I mis, misspoke on that. And, and so I went out on this, you know, I, I remember um, it must have been like the blizzard of 82, um, which was this huge, just came out of nowhere, totally unexpected on Christmas Eve storm that dropped like four feet of snow. It was insane. And, um, and my brother got a bike from Santa. And, and so I remember like, well, well, Santa must be real. Cause how else could you have gotten that bike? I mean, cause you know, we were searching for presents in the house and we couldn't find stuff. So I remember getting on board with the whole Santa thing and he actually sort of like re-engaged that belief and held on to it for a little while longer. Now that's the polished up hallmark version of Joe's story. He, like most of us has a, a complicated and rocky relationship with this season that we find ourselves in. But as far as belief in Santa goes, I don't think it gets much healthier than Joe's experience of it. Now up next, we're gonna hear from Nicholas Hoover, who has a similar story of a rather gentle and beautiful journey of how the belief evolved over the course of his childhood. Like even when we kind of realized that Santa may not be real, that we still, everyone still acted like he was re real. And it's kind of like the spirit of Christmas with Santa. And it was more of a metaphor. And so we kept, you know, we'd continue growing it that way. So in a way he was real. Nicholas learned the truth about Santa Claus by overhearing some other kids talking about it on the playground. And then after that, he had a conversation with his parents about it. I think at some point I, d I then talked to them about it, and my, that's when my mom told me about uh, the spirit of Christmas and Santa and Santa as a metaphor and stuff like that. Because it, it is kind of a—I don't know—I always thought that was a little weird. It's like a huge lie almost that your parents are telling you, and when you find out, I don't know if. I really saw my parents as people who lied at that point, you know? And, uh, so when she told me about the metaphor of Christmas and giving and everything, I really kind of ate it up <laughs> partially because I just believed in them in general. Looking back at his family's Christmas festivities, Nicholas notes one particular tradition that he feels like began to gently usher in the notion that the Santa Claus tale might be more metaphor than fact. So when we're all sitting here around the tree and after we've done the stockings with all the little toys and, you know, candy and stuff like that, um, and we were starting to do the presents, someone asks the Santa's elf and gets uh, uh, presents for people and, you know, they they try to dole it out evenly and, you know, so it's like a responsibility. And so I almost think that's like the beginning of seeing the whole thing as a metaphor. Earlier, I shared with you my dad's thoughts on his experiences surrounding Christmas growing up. And now in the final segment here, I'm going to share with you some of my mom's thoughts and experiences. Around her house growing up, belief in Santa wasn't a huge thing, and it also wasn't a shoot. As she remembers, they engaged the belief in a mainly cultural manner. But when it comes to the matter of the magic of Christmas and aging, she really has some great insight and wisdom. So I'm going to let her speak the final words on the topic. 
so that is it's a magical time for children no matter how we look at it i think i do remember the year magic went out at christmas and i don't remember if that's the relationship of find out santa's real i just remember standing in the kitchen washing dishes and Christmas had lost magic that it had when I was younger. It was, a, I think, a gift of childhood that that's there. And, and once it's gone, part of the mystery is gone. I don't know. That's just thinking out of the box. And so I do, I do think it returns, though, in a way when a person... Not about Christmas itself, but when a person becomes able to look beyond the four walls of real of, of of what seems to be reality, I'll never forget that movie we watched, uh, Patch Adams with Robin Williams. I mean, one of the most significant things to me in that movie, and I may have shared this with you before, is the the guy who was the um, I don't know, he was the brilliant man who was in the mental institution, but he was mentally ill. And Robin Williams, you know, goes and talks to him and, and he holds up his fingers and he asks Robin Williams to count them. And Robin Williams counts five. And he says, now, look past that. And when, if you ever do that and you look past it, what is there, six or seven fingers there? You know, in reality, there's physical, there's five physical fingers. There's such a reality when we that's beyond our focus. And that's, how I think, how faith, no matter what faith looks like for a person, allows a person to refocus past physical reality to something that's true. And anyhow, so that's a real meaningful scene in that movie for me. You got to try this little experiment that my mom just mentioned. And in case that didn't make sense, what you got to do is just hold your hand out in front of you, stare at your hand, and then... Stare at a distant object past your hand. And when you do that, that shifts. That shifts the way in which you see your hand. And it's a really interesting little experiment to try. On one side of the belief, Santa is as real as any physical object. It's as real as the five fingers on your hand in front of your face. But at some point, that belief fades. At worst, it gets stripped away and the whole thing just feels like a giant lie. And at best, the magic slowly fades away. But as we age, we can begin to see the beauty and the magic and the anticipation that it can bring to the lives of children. And we can begin to see beyond the myth. Not focusing on the detail of the myth itself, but instead what it can bring to this insanely complicated experience of being human. And I've got to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know how we're planning to play the whole Santa story with my three-year-old daughter here. We need to get that figured out before next year, probably. <laughs> but I do know this. I want to do whatever it takes to help her be a person that sees beyond just the mere myth. And to be one who doesn't judge what she encounters in her life by measures of absolute truth, but rather looks at the world around her and extracts the beauty that she can find rather than critiquing the parts that are flawed. And how this Santa Claus myth play into that exactly? I really don't know. And only time is going to tell. But for the rest of this holiday season, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. And however you're celebrating, do it up. Go all out and engage, engage, engage with it. And find the beauty wherever it may lie. Merry Christmas.